Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Across South America is a travelogue written by Hiram Bingham, an American explorer and academic who is best known for his rediscovery of the ancient Inca city of Machu Picchu in 1911. The book was published in 1911 and provides a detailed account of Bingham's explorations and adventures across various regions of South America. In Across South America, Bingham takes readers on a captivating journey through the continent, sharing his experiences, observations, and discoveries. The book primarily focuses on his expeditions in Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil, as well as his encounters with indigenous peoples, historical sites, and natural wonders. Across South America provides a compelling first-hand account of Bingham's explorations and adventures in the early 20th century. It offers readers a glimpse into the diverse landscapes, ancient civilizations, and natural wonders of South America and remains an important historical document of exploration in the region. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 Pernambuco and Bahia. There are two ways of going to the east coast of South America. The traveler can sail from New York in the monthly boats of the direct line or if he misses that boat, as I did, and is pressed for time, he can go to Southampton or Cherbourg and be sure of an excellent steamer every week. The old story that one was obliged to go by way of Europe to get to Brazil is no longer true although this pleasing fiction is still maintained by a few officials when they are ordered to go from Lima on the Pacific to the Peruvian port of Iquitos on the Amazon. If they succeed in avoiding the very unpleasant overland journey by a Cerro de Pasco, they are apt to find that the only feasible alternative route is by way of Panama, New York, and Paris. Personally, I was glad of the excuse to go the longer way, for I knew that the exceedingly comfortable new steamers of the Royal Mail Line were likely to carry many Brazilians and Argentinos from whom I could learn much that I wanted to know. They proved to be most kind and communicative and gave me an excellent introduction to the point of view of the modern denizen of the East Coast whose lands have received the golden touch that comes from foreign capital, healthy immigration, and rapidly expanding railway systems. I was also fortunate in finding on board the Aragon a large number of those energetic English, Scots, and French whose well-directed efforts have built up the industries of their adopted homes until the Spanish Americans can hardly recognize the land of their birth and the average North American who visits the East Coast for the first time rubs his eyes in despair and wonders where he has been while all this railroad building and bank merging has been going on. If there were few Germans and Italians on board, it was not because they were not crossing the ocean at the same time, but because they preferred the new steamers of their own lines. I could have traveled a little faster by sailing under the German or the Italian flag, but in that case I should not have seen Pernambuco and Bahia, which the more speedy steamers now omit from their itinerary. The Brazilians call the easternmost port of South America, Recife, the reef, but to the average person it will always be known as Pernambuco. Most travelers who touch here on their way from Europe to Buenos Aires prefer to see what they can of this quaint old city from the deck of the steamer anchored a mile out in the open roadstead. The great ocean swell, rolling in from the eastward, makes the tight little surf boats bob up and down in a dangerous fashion. 
It seems hardly worthwhile to venture down the slippery gangway and take one's chances at leaping into the strong arms of swarthy boatmen whom the waves bring upward toward you with startling suddenness and who fall away again so exasperatingly just as you have made up your mind to jump. Out of 300 first cabin passengers on the Aragon, there were only five of us who ventured ashore, dash three Americans, a Frenchman, and a Scotchman. The other passengers, including several representatives of the English army, but I will say no more, for they afterwards wrote me that, on their return journey to England, the charms of Pernambuco overcame their fear of the white horses of the sea, and they felt well repaid. Pernambuco is unquestionably one of the most interesting places on the East Coast. From the steamer one can see little more than a long low line of coast dotted here and there with white buildings and a lighthouse or two. To the north several miles away, on a little rise of ground, is the ancient town of Olinda, founded by the Portuguese in the 16th century, a hundred years before Henry Hudson stepped ashore on Manhattan Island. By the time that our ancestors were beginning to consider establishing a colony in Massachusetts, the Portuguese had already built dozens of sugar factories in this vicinity. Then the Dutch came and conquered, built Pernambuco and, during their 25 years on this coast, made it the administrative center for their colony in northeast Brazil. Their capital, for miles north of the present commercial center, is now a village of ruined palaces and ancient convents. The Dutch had large interests on the Brazilian seaboard and carried away quantities of sugar and other precious commodities, as is set forth in many of their quaint old books. The drawings which old Newhoff put in his sumptuous folio two centuries ago are still vivid and lifelike, even if they serve only to emphasize the great change that has come over this part of the world in that time. Now, three transatlantic cables touch here and it is a port of call for half a dozen lines of steamers. The old Dutch caravels used to find excellent shelter behind the great natural breakwater, the reef that made the port of Recife possible. No part of the east coast of Brazil possesses more strategical importance and modern improvements have deepened the entrance so that vessels drawing less than 15 feet may enter and lie in quiet water although the great ocean liners are obliged to ride at anchor outside. Tugs bring out lighters for the cargo, but the passengers have to trust to the mercy of the surf boats. It took six dusky oarsmen to pull us through the surf and around the lighthouse that marks the northern extremity of the reef into the calm waters of the harbor. On the Black Reef, a few rods south of the lighthouse stands an antiquated castle, which modern guns would make short work of, but which served its purpose admirably by defending the port against the sea rovers of the 17th century. Opposite this breakwater, on two or three sea islands whose tidal rivers cut them off from the mainland, the older part of Pernambuco is built. It was with a feeling of having miraculously escaped from the dangers of a very stormy voyage that we clambered up the slippery stone stairs of the landing stage and entered the little two-story octagonal structure which serves the custom house as a place in which to examine incoming passengers. This took but a moment and then we went out into the glaring white sunlight of this ancient tropical city and began our tour of inspection. Immediately in front of us was a line of warehouses three or four stories high and attractively built of stone. They give the waterfront an air of permanency and good breeding. Between them and the seawall there was a tree-planted, stone-paved area, the Rialto of Recife, where all classes, from talkative half-tipsy pieces of foreign driftwood to well-dressed local merchants, clad in immaculate white suits, congregate and gossip. Beyond the seawall, a dozen small ocean steamers lay inside the harbor, moored to the breakwater, while numbers of smaller vessels, sloops, schooners, and brigantines were anchored near the custom house docks or in the sluggish Rio Beberibe, which separates Recife from the mainland. 
As we wandered through the streets past the stock exchange, the naval station, and the principal business houses, we saw various sights. A poorly dressed Brazilian of mixed African and Portuguese descent carrying a small coffin on his head, barefooted children standing in pools of water left in the paved sidewalks by the showers of the morning, bareheaded women with gaily colored shawls over their shoulders, neat German clerks dressed in glistening white duck suits, lounging boatmen in nondescript apparel, and everywhere long, low trays loaded with bags of sugar, each vehicle drawn by a single patient ox whose horns are lashed to a cross piece that connects the front end of the thills. Those who moved it all moved as if there were abundant time in which to do everything, and as though the hustle and bustle of lower New York never existed at all. The scene was distinctively Latin American. One must be careful not to say Spanish American here, for if there is one thing more than another that the Brazilian is proud of, it is that he is not a Spaniard and does not speak Spanish. However, the difference between the two languages is not so great and the local pride not so strong but that the obliging natives will understand you even if you have the bad taste to address them in Spanish. They will reply, however, in Portuguese, and then it is your turn to be obliging and understand them if you can. West of Recife, on another island and on the mainland, are the other public buildings, parks, and the finest residences. A primitive tram car, pulled by mules, crosses the bridge and jangles along toward the suburbs, which are quite pretty, although some of the houses strive after bizarre color effects which would not be appropriate in the temperate zone. There are fairly good hotels here, and there is quite a little English colony. But it is not a place where the white man thrives. The daily range of temperature is very small, and it is claimed that the average difference between the wet and dry season is only 3 degrees. From Pernambuco there radiate three or four railways, north, west, and south. None of them are more than 200 miles long, but all serve to gather up the rich crops of sugar and cotton for which the surrounding region is noted and bring them to the cargo steamers that offer and exchange the manufactured products of Europe and America. If one may judge from the size of the custom house and the busy scene there, where half a dozen steam cranes were actively engaged in unloading goods destined to pay the annoyingly complex Brazilian tariff, the business of the port is very considerable. It seemed quite strange to see such mechanical activity and such a modern customs warehouse so closely associated with the narrow, foul-smelling streets of the old town. But it gives promise of a larger and more important city in the years to come, when the new docks shall have been built and still more modern methods introduced. Yet even now there are over 150,000 people in the city, and the mercantile houses do a good business. The clerks move slowly, and there is little appearance of enterprise, but one must always remember, when inclined to criticize the business methods of the tropics, that this is not a climate where one can safely hurry. Things must be done slowly if the doer is to last any length of time. The commercial traveler who comes here full of brusque and zealous activity will soon chafe himself into a fever if he is not careful. These are easygoing folk, and political and commercial changes do not affect them seriously. They are willing to stand governmental conditions that would be almost intolerable to us, and their haphazard methods of business are well suited to their environment. The European, although proverbially less adaptable than the American, is forced by keener competition at home to adjust himself as best he may to the local conditions here and elsewhere in South America. His American colleague, on the other hand, has as yet not felt the necessity of learning to meet what seems to him ridiculous prejudice. Emblematic of this Brazilian trait are the primitive little catamarans in which the fishermen of Recife venture far out into the grey ocean. The frail little craft are only moderately safe, 
and at best can bring back but a small quantity of fish. They are most uncomfortable and their occupants are kept wet most of the time by the waves that dash over them. Furthermore, a glimpse of them is as much of Pernambuco as most steamship passengers get. It is only by venturing and taking the trouble to go ashore that one can see the modern custom house dock on the other side of Recife and learn the lesson of the possibilities of commerce here. We left Pernambuco in the afternoon and reached the green hills of the coast near Bahia the next morning. The steamers pass near enough to the shore to enable one to make out with the glasses, watering places and pretty little villas that have been built on the ocean side of the peninsula by the wealthier citizens of Bahia. At the end of the promontory, just above the rocks and the breakers, is the picturesque white tower of a lighthouse. Unfortunately, it did not avail to save a fine German steamer that was lying wrecked on the dangerous shoals near the entrance to the harbor when we passed it. As we steamed slowly around the southern end of the low promontory, the city of Bahia gradually came into view, its large stone warehouses lining the waterfront, its lower town separated by a steep hill, covered with gardens and graceful palms from the upper city, conspicuous with the towers and cupolas of numerous churches and public buildings. On the left, as one enters the harbor, rises the interesting island of Itaparica, which England once offered to take in payment of a debt due her by Portugal. It bears a resemblance to Gibraltar in more ways than one, but it was not destined to become a British stronghold. A favorite resort of the citizens of Bahia, it is called the Europe of the Poor because it has a genial climate and is frequented by those who cannot afford to cross the Atlantic. As we lead on our left, in front of us, and to the north, lies the magnificent bay that has given the city its name. It lacks the romantic mountains that make Rio so famous, yet its beautiful blue waters are most alluring, dotted as they are here and there with the white sails of fishing boats and catamarans. We have to anchor a mile from the shore, and a steam launch carrying the port officials soon comes alongside. The local boatmen, whose little craft, suited only to the quiet waters of the bay, bear no resemblance to the seaworthy surf boats of Pernambuco, line up at a distance of half a mile, awaiting the signal which permits them to hoist sail and race for the steamer. It is a pretty sight, enlivened by the shouts of the boat crews. Some boats are loaded with delicious tropical fruits that are eagerly bargained for by our steerage passengers, most of whom are Spanish peasants on their way to harvest the crops of Argentina. Others are anxious to take us ashore. And after the usual delay, we make a deal with a boatman, a lazy fellow who wastes a lot of time trying to sail and against the wind while his more energetic competitors are rowing. On the way we pass half a dozen steamers and a few sailing vessels and steer carefully between scores of huge lighters and dozens of smaller craft. In place of the steel steam cranes which we saw at Pernambuco, on the wharves are numerous wooden cranes worked by hand. We land on slippery wooden stairs and hurry across the blistering hot pavements of the street to rest for a few moments in the shade of the large warehouses and wholesale shops that crowd the lower town. Some of the signs are decidedly bizarre and scream as loudly for patronage as the limits of modern Frenchified Portuguese art will permit. There is none of the picturesqueness of Pernambuco, and we soon betake ourselves to one of the cog railways where, for a few cents, we are allowed to scramble into a bare little wooden passenger coach and be yanked up the steep incline by a cable that looks none too strong for its purpose. Once in the upper city, the narrow streets of commerce seem to be left behind, and we are in broader thoroughfares, with here and there a green park full of palms and other tropical plants. There are churches on every side some of them wonderfully decorated and most attractive. Bahia is not quite so old as Pernambuco, its foundation dating only from the middle of the 16th century, 
but it early became the religious and intellectual center of Portuguese America, and it is still noted for its literature and culture, although long ago passed in the race by Rio. The glaring white sunlight throws everything into bold relief and makes the shadows seem unusually dark and cool. On the corners of the streets are little folding stands bearing a heavy load of toothsome confectionery. Their barefooted coal black owners, clad generally in white, lean against the iron posts of the American trolley car system and watch patiently for the trade that seems sure to come to him who waits. On every side one sees black faces. In fact, Bahia is sometimes popularly spoken of as the old militress in affectionate reference to the fact that more than 90% of its 200,000 people are of African descent. For over two centuries Bahia monopolized the slave trade of Brazil. Her traders continued to be the chief importers of Negroes down to the middle of the 19th century. It is said that as many as 60,000 slaves were brought in within a single year. We took one of the American-made trolleys and soon went whizzing along through well-paved streets and out into the suburbs. Here villas, fearfully and wonderfully made, like the baker's best wedding cake in his shop window, attest to the local fondness for Rococo extravagance. In general, however, the principal buildings appear to be well built and are frequently four or five stories in height. The architecture of Bahia is decidedly Portuguese, much more so than that of Pernambuco, which still bears traces of its Dutch origin and even reminds one of Curaçao. Some of the villas in Bahia are strikingly like those in Lisbon. And there are other likenesses between the Portuguese capital and this ecclesiastical metropolis of Brazil. Both are situated on magnificent estuaries and present a fine spectacle to the traveler coming by sea. Both have upper and lower towns with hills so steep as to require the services of elevators and cog or cable railways to connect them. The upper town of each commands an extensive view of the shipping, the roadstead, and the surrounding country. But here the similarity ends, for Lisbon is built on several hills, while Bahia occupies but a single headland, the verdure-clad promontory which shelters the magnificent bay. Bahia is the center for a considerable commerce in sugar and cotton, cocoa and tobacco. These are brought to the port by land and water, but chiefly by the railroads that go north to the Great River San Francisco and west into the heart of the state. There are many evidences of wealth in the city, and there is certainly an excellent opportunity for developing foreign trade. One looks in vain, however, for great American commercial houses like those which mark the presence of English, French, and German enterprise. Nevertheless, the electric car line, with its American equipment, gives a promise of things hoped for. And there is a decided air of friendliness toward Americans on the part of the Brazilians whom one meets on the streets and in the shops. There is none of that chip-on-the-shoulder attitude which the Argentino likes to exhibit toward the citizens of the United States of North America. The Brazilian appears to realize that Americans are his best customers and he is desirous of maintaining the most friendly relations with us. Chapter 2 Rio, Santos, and Brazilian Trade Two days sail from Bahia brought us within sight of the wonderful mountains that mark the entrance to the Bay of Rio de Janeiro. As one approaches land, the first thing that catches the eye is the far-famed Sugarloaf Mountain which seems to guard the southern side of the entrance. Back of it is a region even more romantic, a cluster of higher mountains, green to their tops, yet with sides so precipitous and pinnacles so sharp one wonders how anything can grow on them. The region presents, in fact, such a prodigious variety of crags and precipices peaks and summits that the separate forms are lost in a chaos of beautiful hills. 
The great granite rocks that guard the entrance to the harbor leave a passage scarcely a mile in width. At the base of the sugar loaf we saw a fairy white city romantically nestling in the shadow of the gigantic crag. It is the new national exposition of Brazil. Once safely inside the granite barriers, the bay opens out and becomes an inland sea dotted with hundreds of islands, a landlocked basin with 50 square miles of deep water. On the northern shores of the bay lies the town of Nicthroy, the capital of the state. Its name perpetuates the old Indian title of the bay, Hidden Water. The name of the capital of the Republic on the south side of the bay carries with it a remembrance of the fact that when first discovered, the bay was mistaken for the mouth of a great river, the River of January. Since the early years of the 16th century, Rio has been conspicuous in the annals of discovery and conquest. Magellan touched here on his famous voyage round the world. The spot where he landed is now the site of a large hospital and medical school. French Huguenots attempted to find here a refuge in the time of the great Admiral Coligny. As one steams slowly into the harbor, one passes close to the historic island of Vilgagnon, whose romantic story has been so graphically told by Parkman. Hither came the King of Portugal, flying from the wrath of Napoleon. Here lived the good Emperor Don Pedro II, one of the most beneficent monarchs the world has ever seen. And into these waters are soon to come Brazil's new dreadnoughts, about which all the world has been speculating and which have made Argentina almost forget the necessities of economic development in her anxiety to keep up with Brazil in the way of armament. An elaborate system of new docks that has been in the course of construction for a long time has not been completed yet, so we anchor a mile or more from the shore, not far from a score of ocean steamers and half a hundred sailing vessels. Before the anchor falls we are surrounded by a noisy fleet of steam launches whose whistles keep up a most infernal tooting. A score of these insistent screamers attempt to get alongside of our companionway at the same time. In addition, half a hundred rowboats attack the ladder where some of the steerage passengers are trying to disembark. We had heard, before entering the port, that there were several hundred cases of smallpox here, besides other infectious diseases. Yet this did not prevent everybody that wanted to, and could afford the slight cost of transportation from coming out from the shore and boarding our vessel. Such a chattering, such a rustling of silk skirts and a fluttering of feathers on enormous hats, such ecstatic greetings given to returning citizens, such ultra-Parisian fashions. On shore we found the marks of modern real electric cars, fashionable automobiles, well-paved streets, electric lights, and comfortable hotels very much in evidence. Were it not for the blinding sunlight that fairly puts one's eyes out in the middle of the day, one could readily forget one's whereabouts. To be sure, if you go to look for it, there is the older part of the city which still needs cleaning up according to modern ideas of sanitation. But if you are content to spend your time in the fashionable end of the town or speeding along the fine new thoroughfares in a fast motor car, it is easy to think no more of Rio's bad record as an unhealthy port. The city of Rio is spread over a large peninsula that juts out from the south into the waters of the Great Bay. Across the peninsula, through the center of the busiest part of the city, the Brazilians have recently opened a broad boulevard the Avenida Central. Fine modern business blocks have sprung up as if by magic and the effect is most resplendent. The spacious avenue is in marked contrast with the very narrow little streets that cross it. One of them, the Rua Ovidor, the meeting place of the wits of Rio, is in many ways the most interesting street in Brazil. Here one may see everybody that is anybody in Rio. At one end of the Avenida Central is Monroe Palace, 
which once did duty an international exposition and more recently was the meeting place of the third Pan-American Conference made notable by the presence of Secretary Root. Beyond the showy palace to the east there are a number of little bays, semicircular indentations in the shore, which have recently been lined with splendid broad driveways, where one may enjoy the sea breeze and a marvelous view over the inland sea to the mountains beyond. At the far end of the new parkway rises the ever-present Sugarloaf, at whose feet are the buildings of the National Exposition. They are wonderfully well situated, lying as they do on a little isthmus wedged in between two gigantic rocks, with the ocean on one side and the beautiful bay on the other. The buildings themselves are not particularly remarkable, being decorated in the gorgeous style of elaborate whiteness that one is accustomed to associate with expositions. The crowds I saw there were composed exclusively of Brazilians, most of whom had apparently visited the grounds many times and accepted them as the fashionable evening rendezvous. Each of the states of Brazil had a building of its own in which to exhibit its products, and there was a theater, a fine arts building, a hall of manufactures, and a sad attempt at a midway. An entire building was devoted to the manufactures and exports of Portugal. All other buildings were devoted to the states or industries of Brazil, making the prejudice in favor of the mother country all the more noticeable. A change is coming over the foreign commerce of Rio. Twenty years ago, the largest importing firms were French and English. Many of these have practically disappeared, having been driven out by Portuguese, Italian, and German houses. The marked leaning toward goods of Portuguese origin is very striking and naturally difficult to combat. Brazil has recently established in Paris an office for promoting the country and aiding its economic expansion. This office is publishing a considerable literature, mostly in French, and will undoubtedly be able to bring about an increase of European commerce and that immigration which Brazil so much needs. The completion of the new docks will greatly help matters. But besides new docks, Rio needs a reformed customs service. Everyone has agreed that the most vexatious thing in Rio is the attitude of the custom house officials either because they are poorly paid or else simply because they have fallen into extremely bad habits, they are allowed to receive tips and gratuities openly. The result may easily be imagined. A few days after my arrival, an American naturalist, thoroughly honest but of a rather short temper, was treated with outrageous discourtesy and his personal effects strewn unceremoniously over the dirty floor of the warehouse by angry inspectors simply because he was unwilling to bribe them. There was no question as to his having any dutiable goods. The population of Rio is variously estimated at between seven and eight hundred thousand but her enthusiastic citizens frequently exaggerate this and speak in an offhand way of her having a million people. They are naturally reluctant to admit that Rio has any fewer than Buenos Aires. The suburbs of Rio are remarkably attractive. On the Great Bay, dotted with its beautiful islands, are various resorts that take advantage of the natural beauties of the place and cater to the pleasure-loving Brazilians. From various ports on the bay, railroads radiate in all possible directions, going north into the heart of the mining region and west through the coffee country to Sao Paulo. The terminus of a little scenic railway is the top of one of the highest and most remarkable of the nearby peaks, the Corcovado. The view from the summit can scarcely be surpassed in the whole world. The intensely blue waters of the bay the bright white sunlight reflected from the fleecy cumulus clouds so typical of the tropics, the verdure-clad hills, and the white city spread out like a map on the edge of the bay, combined to make a marvelous picture. No account of Rio, however brief, would be complete without some reference to the Journal du Comercio, 
the leading newspaper of Brazil, whose owner and editor, Dr. J. C. Rodriguez, is one of the most influential men in the country. In addition to guiding public opinion through his powerful and ably edited newspaper, he has had the time to attend to numerous charities and to the collection of a most remarkable library of books relating to Brazil. He has recently taken high rank as a bibliographer by publishing a much sought after volume on early Brasiliana, basing his information largely on his own matchless collection. Another well-edited paper is O País, which like the Journal do Comercio has its own handsome edifice on the new Avenida Central. A subscription to it for one year costs 30,000 reis, a trifle over $9. As in the case of other South American newspapers, its offices are far more luxurious and elaborate than those of their contemporaries in North America. These southern dailies give considerable space to foreign cablegrams, so much more, in fact, than do our own papers that it almost persuades one that we are more provincial than our neighbors. Santos the greatest coffee port in the world and the only city in Brazil having adequate docking facilities is a day's sail from Rio. It is separated from the ocean by winding sea rivers or canals. The marshes and flats that surround it and the bleaching skeletons of sailing vessels that one sees here are sufficient reminders of the terrible epidemics that have been the scourge of Santos in the past. Stories are told of ships that came here for coffee, whose entire crews perished of yellow fever before the cargo could be taken aboard, leaving the vessel to rot at her moorings. All of this has changed now, and the port is as healthy as could be expected. Yet the town is not attractive. It lacks the picturesque oxtrays of Pernambuco and the charming surroundings of Rio. The streets are badly paved and muddy, the clattering meal teams that bring the bags of coffee from the great warehouses to the docks are just like thousands of others in our own western cities. The old-fashioned tram cars, running on the same tracks that the ramshackle suburban trains use, are dirty but not interesting. Prices in the shops are enormously high. In fact, on all sides there is too much evidence of the upsetting influence of a great modern commerce. A long line of steamers lying at the docks taking on coffee is the characteristic feature of the place and a booklet that has recently been issued to advertise the resources of Brazil bears on its cover a branch of the coffee tree loaded with red berries behind which is the photograph of a great ocean liner into whose steel sides marches an unending procession of stevedores carrying on their backs sacks of coffee. It not only emphasizes Brazil's greatest industry, but it is also thoroughly typical of Santos. Most of the coffee is grown in the mountains to the north and comes to Santos from Sao Paulo on a splendidly equipped British-built railway. The line is one of the finest in South America. It rises rapidly through a beautiful tropical valley by a gradient so steep as to necessitate the use of a cable and cogs for a large part of the distance. The powerhouses scattered at intervals along the line are models of cleanliness and mechanical perfection. Notwithstanding the fact that America is by far the greatest consumer of Santos coffee, the greater part of the local enterprises are in British hands. The investment of British capital in Brazil is enormous. It has been computed that it amounts to over $600 million. Americans do not seem yet to have waked up to the possibilities of Brazilian commerce or to the fact that the question of American trade with Brazil is an extremely important one. It is only necessary to realize that the territory of Brazil is larger than that of the United States, that the population of Brazil is greater than all the rest of South America put together, and that Brazil's exports exceed her imports by $100 million annually to understand the opportunity for developing our foreign trade. 
Brazil produces considerably more than half of the world's supply of coffee, besides enormous quantities of rubber. The possibilities for increased production of raw material are almost incalculable. It is just the sort of market for us. Here we can dispose of our manufactured products and purchase what will not grow at home. We have made some attempts to develop the field, even though our knowledge is too often limited to that of the delightful person who knew Brazil was the place where the nuts come from. We have little conception of the great distances that separate the important cities of Brazil and of the difficulties of transportation. A story is told in Rio of an attempt to go from Rio to Sao Paulo by motor over the cart road that connects the two largest cities in the Republic. The trip by railway takes about 12 hours. The automobile excursion took three weeks of most fearful drudgery. Needless to say, the cars did not come back by their own power. It is more difficult for a merchant in one of the great coast cities of central Brazil to keep in touch with the Amazon than it is for a Chicago merchant to keep in touch with Australia. Furthermore, to one who tries to master the situation, the coinage and the monetary system seem at first sight to present an insuperable obstacle. To have a bill for dinner rendered in thousands of reese is rather confusing until one comes to regard the thousand ray piece as equivalent to about 30 cents. Another and much more serious difficulty is the poor mail service to and from New York. To the traveler in South America, unquestionably the most exasperating annoyance everywhere is the insecurity and irregularity of the mails. The Latin American mind seems to be more differently constituted from ours in that particular than in any other. He knows that the service is bad, slow, and unreliable. But it seems to make little difference to him, and the only effort he makes to overcome the frightfully unsatisfactory conditions is by resorting to the registered mail, to which he entrusts everything that is of importance. Add to this fact the infrequency of direct mail steamers from the United States to the East Coast, and it may readily be seen where lies one of the most serious obstacles in the way of extending our commerce with Brazil. A marked peculiarity of the Brazilian market is its extreme conservatism. Brazilians who have become accustomed to buying French, English, and German products are loath to change. American products are unfashionable. The Brazilian who can afford it travels on the luxuriously appointed steamers of the Royal Mail, and he and his friends regard articles of English make as much more fashionable and luxurious than those from the United States. This is largely due to the lack of commercial prestige which we enjoy in the coast cities of Brazil. The Brazilians cannot understand why they see no American banks and no American steamship lines. Our flag never appears in their ports except as it is carried by a man of war or an antiquated wooden sailing vessel. To their minds this is proof conclusive that the American, who claims that his country is one of the most important commercial nations in the world, is merely bluffing. Such prejudices can only be overcome by strict attention to business, and this attention our exporters have in large measure not yet thought it worthwhile to give. The agents that they send to Brazil rarely speak Portuguese and are unable to compete with the expert linguists who come out from Europe. Frequently they even lack that technical training in the manufacture of the goods which they are trying to sell, which gives their German competitors so great an advantage. Still more important than commercial travelers in a country like Brazil is the establishment of agencies where goods may be attractively displayed. An active importer told me that, in his opinion, the most essential thing for Americans to do was to maintain permanent depots or expositions where their goods could be seen and handled. Relatively little good seems to result from the use of catalogs, even when printed in the language of the country, 
owing to the insecurity of the mails and the absence of American banks or express companies which would ensure the delivery of goods ordered. Finally, it is disgraceful to be obliged to repeat the old story of American methods of packing goods for shipment to South America. This fact has been so often alluded to in many different publications that it might seem as though further criticism were unnecessary. Unfortunately, however, in spite of repeated protests, American shippers, forgetful of the almost entire absence of docks and docking facilities here, continue to pack their goods as if they were destined for Europe. At most of the ports, lighters have to be used. These resemble small coal barges, into which the goods are lowered over the side of the vessel. Often more or less of a sea is running, and notwithstanding all the care that may be used the durability of the packing cases is tested to the utmost. I saw a box containing a typewriter dumped on top of a pile of miscellaneous merchandise from which it rolled down, bumping and thumping into the farther corner of the barge. Fortunately, this particular typewriter belonged to a make of American machines whose manufacturers have learned to pack their goods in such form as to stand just that kind of treatment. The result is that one sees that brand of machine all over South America. The American consul in Rio, Mr. Anderson, has been doing a notable service in recent years by sending more full and accurate reports of business conditions in Brazil, and our special agent, Mr. Lincoln Hutchinson, has written excellent reports on trade conditions in South America. To the labors of both these gentlemen, I am greatly indebted for information on this subject.